Hello, everybody. Um, today we are back for episode 7, which means that this channel has now been around for a full week, and I have yet to lose my job. That is absolutely huge. Uh, if you're new here, please um, click the subscribe button. I don't actually care if you unsubscribe later. I just kind of want to hit that 100 number so I can, um, you know, get naked for the camera. And then, you know, unsubscribe will go back below. Who cares? But, uh, yeah, let's talk about weak isolation levels because this is kind of the last thing that I wanted to cover before doing, like, a full-on uh, straight-up database comparison um, between, like, a bunch of the popular technologies. So, okay, I'll get into the PowerPoint. Okay, so today's video is on weak isolation levels. If you recall from last video's content, um, the point of transactions is that they're a really useful abstraction. However, the trade-off of using them is that they're really slow because databases have to actually implement serializable isolation. Instead, what many databases will choose to do instead is throw out serializable isolation and instead offer weaker guarantees about transaction isolation. So we're in order to kind of um, present this, we're going to go through a bunch of concurrency bugs and look at the strategies that databases use in order to mitigate them without providing complete isolation. Okay, so there are five types of concurrency bugs that we're going to talk about. Dirty reads, dirty writes, read skew, lost updates, and then write skew in conjunction with phantoms. What are dirty reads? Well, this is basically just saying that um, if data has been written by a transaction but it hasn't yet committed, let's say a transaction has to make multiple writes and one of the writes has been done but the other hasn't so it's not committed yet, um, any writes that have not been committed should not be read by a different transaction. It's pretty simple. How do we actually go about solving this? Well, um, it's pretty uh, easy to do. The database just makes sure to remember the old value of a write until it's completed and this way you don't have to use locks because that would take a huge performance hit on the system. So let's say we're editing the key Kim's man, used to be Kanye. We're now going to update it to Pete, but until that transaction is completed, we're going to store both values. And then finally, once the transaction is complete, we just store Pete. And that way that um, if any transaction tries to read from that, it'll see Kanye until the write is completely committed or aborted. Okay, dirty writes. When writing data, we're not going to overwrite uh, non-committed data, so we can only overwrite committed data. How do we solve this? Well, for every single object, we just put a lock on it, and you can only have one writer thread operating on that at a time. So um, if that write has not yet been committed, the transaction that made the write is still holding the lock, and the second it commits or aborts, the transaction releases the lock. Okay, now let's talk about read committed isolation. So the whole point of read committed isolation is this is going to be the weakest isolation level because all it does is actually go ahead and solve those dirty reads and dirty writes. But it's pretty easy to implement and it doesn't take too big of a performance hit at all, which is why it can be useful. Okay, the next concurrency bug we're going to talk about is read skew. Read skew is basically saying, let's imagine we have a long read query that's going to read a bunch of rows or objects from the database. But while that query is actually reading from the database, um, what it's going to see is that multiple rows are changing since it's a super long query. In fact, some of the rows are going to be changing even while the read is happening. So it might actually observe the database in an inconsistent state. Um, so the solution here is snapshot isolation, which I'll explain in a moment. But to, to summarize read skew even more, let's imagine I'm Venmo, okay, and I want to sum up the total balances of all the accounts in my system. So I start running this huge query, which is going to go through all of the rows of the users and um, add up their balances. So let's say now I'm in Venmo with my $100 account, and my friend also has $100 in Venmo. But while this long read analytics query is running, my friend transfers me $50. However, before he transfers me the $50, the analytics query reads the balance of my account. So the analytics query thinks that I have $100 in my account. And then, since he's transferred me $50, and then the analytics query reads his account, it thinks that he has $50 in his account. So the total value of both accounts is now messed up. It should be $200, but they think it's only $150. So this is where snapshot isolation comes in. So what is snapshot isolation? Well, it's basically this. Every transaction is assigned a monotonically increasing transaction ID, which just means that um, every single transaction has an ID one higher than the previous one. So when writing a value, what the database is actually going to do is store all of those previous values of that um, key, 
and store it with the transaction ID. So as you can see below, I have for the key Jordan, cute with the transaction ID of one, because that means transaction one wrote that, handsome with a transaction ID of eight, and brolic with a transaction ID of 14. Same thing goes for Bieber, who at one point was gross, has since been updated to uglier than Jordan. And finally, okay, fine, he's good looking. However, let's say transaction 15 wants to read the values for both Jordan and Bieber. While it's currently the case that the database has those values um, most updated being brolic and okay, fine, good looking, transaction 15 is not actually allowed to see the okay, fine, good looking because 15 is less than 19. Instead, transaction 15 must take the most up-to-date value that is basically less than or equal to it. So transaction 15 can see brolic at 14, but not okay, fine, good looking at 19. So instead, we would read brolic and uglier than Jordan. Let's note, though, that if snapshot isolation were not a thing, then transaction 15 might end up reading uh, brolic and okay, fine, good looking, simply by the fact that um, it's possible that transaction 15 would have read the value for Jordan, and then transaction 16 would have committed for Bieber, and then finally 15 would have gone and read that, and then it would have been a different value. So keep in mind that that's the race condition that snapshot isolation is going to be preventing. Okay, next, we've got lost updates. So basically, there's something called a read, modify, write cycle that we see happening a lot in databases where we want to read some value, modify it by a certain amount, and then write it back to the database. So for example, let's say my net worth is a million dollars. In reality, it's about you know 100 times that, but let's not worry about that. We've got two transactions, both of which are going to read my net worth and add another million dollars to it because this YouTube channel has been going crazy. Okay, so with this in mind, both of those reads are going to see that I have a million dollars in my account, and then they're gonna add another million both of which now think that I have $2 million. Now they're both going to write, and it seems like I only have $2 million, when in reality I've been conned out of a million. So there are three possible solutions for this, and I'll discuss all three of them. Those are atomic write operations, explicit locking, or automatic database detection. Okay, atomic write operations. A lot of databases actually have built-in um, atomic counters, or operations like compare and set that allow you to um, you know, do something like an increment without actually having to worry about concurrency issues. However, not all of them do, or perhaps we're doing something else like, I don't know, appending to a string or something. And in that case, you may actually have to use explicit locks in your application code. Um, keep in mind though that explicit locking in application code is kind of annoying as a developer and you obviously don't want to have a bug in there because you know keeping a lock and never releasing it, for example, can really do a number on your database. So instead, whenever possible, it's better to use automatic database detection. This is basically when the database says, okay, I can see that the premise of one of these read, modify, write cycles has changed, and as a result of it changing, we know that one of these transactions is going to be invalid, we have to retry it. How can we do that? Well, it's really easy in conjunction with snapshot isolation because of the fact that you can actually see what a given transaction read, and then you know that that's changed right before it writes back. So again, this is good because um, it reduces the opportunities of us as developers to write bad code. Um, the thing though is that in multi-leader leaderless replication, these techniques don't work. For example, let's say um, you know I wanna add a million dollars to my account, and then um, you know my business partner in China also wants to add a million dollars to my account. So we both are going to attempt to add that counter. However, my counter doesn't even exist in the Chinese version of the database. And as a result, this is all moot. So basically the, the point there is, is that something like an atomic write operation doesn't exactly work in uh, setups where there are multiple possible leaders. And as a result, that's where we would use something like um, conflict resolution, where you know we store them as siblings, or something like a CRDT, which I briefly touched on in the multi-leader replication video. Okay, next let's talk about write skew. So two transactions are going to read the same set of objects in order to make basically a predicate, and they're going to use that predicate in order to make a subsequent decision, which is reflected as a write. However, because of the fact that these two transactions are going to change different members of the table, um, those members are not necessarily going to be locked. So what do we have to do? We have to go ahead and lock every single um, thing in that predicate. 
So for example, let's say this is a table right here. I'm at the club, and as you can see, I'm currently sitting at a table with Lindsay Lohan, and the tables only have capacity for three. So it's important that only three people can be sitting at table one. So what's going to happen? Um, one transaction is going to see two people at table one, and another transaction is going to also see two people at table one, and they're both going to update their row to join my table. Obviously, this is what breaks the invariant. I said there are only three people to a table. And the only way to actually solve this problem is to make sure that we can go ahead and lock all of the rows originally of people on table one so that that way uh, only one transaction can read those at a time. So like I said, this is called a predicate lock. You're literally just putting a, uh, a lock on all those rows. And that way, um, only one transaction can read them. However, a problem that comes up here is what if those rows don't all exist yet? So going back, what if, for example, um, Kate Upton and Megan Fox weren't actually in the table yet because they hadn't joined the club and weren't standing around at no table? Well, this is called a phantom. It's the same issue as right skew, but the problem here is that the invariants are broken when both transactions create a new row because there was actually nothing to put a lock on. So the solution here would actually be to materialize conflicts. So let's discuss that. Imagine I want to book a meeting in a given room at some given time. First, I would query the database to see if there's a row in the bookings table that already corresponds to that room in that time. Then, if it's not there, I would actually go ahead and add my meeting slot as a new row to the bookings table. However, let's imagine it's not there. If it's not, I can't apply a predicate lock to that condition because of the fact that there's no row in the database. So what we actually have to do is create a dummy row in our bookings table, let's say, Every single meeting for a given week, we're going to use like a scheduled job or a cron job to create all those dummy rows for a given week. And then that way I can put a lock on that and then claim the room for myself. This is called materializing conflicts because we're actually purposely materializing some row that we can have transactions conflict on via grabbing that lock. So I would actually create an empty row, go ahead and lock it, and then that way we could assure isolation there. Okay, so... I know this was a little bit to digest, but it's not overly complicated at the end of the day. So to summarize it, read committed isolation is going to prevent dirty reads and dirty writes. Snapshot isolation is going to prevent read skew, which is more or less when you see that database in an inconsistent state amongst rows. And it can be easily adapted to detect those lost updates, which is really good because then the developer doesn't have to deal with explicit locking. Finally, predicate locks and materializing conflicts can be used to prevent write skew and phantoms, which is when you read a bunch of rows in a query, use that as your predicate, and either change an existing row or write a new row. Okay, so basically, when should we use these weak isolation levels? Well, like I said, oftentimes it's the case that databases can't actually handle the performance impact that it takes to use actual serializable isolation. However, it is the case as well that um, when you are able to handle that load, perhaps you should just use serializable isolation because it's a lot simpler to think about and you don't have to reason about the other concurrency bugs that your weak isolation levels may have missed. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to be doing a, probably a pretty dense video next time to do a bit of a database comparison. But uh, yeah, I'll see you then.